today is Wednesday, September 25th, 2019. My name is Edna Sussman. I'm a reference librarian at the Half Hollow Hills Community Library in Dix Hills, New York. We're interviewing Richard L. Biscardi, a World War II Army veteran at the Long Island State Veterans Home here in Stony Brook, New York. This is part of our Veterans Testimonial Project and in collaboration with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Thank you so much, Rich, for your service and for participating in our project today. Thank you. Thank you. Rich, where and when were you born? I was born in New York City. And what, when? Uh, what 1926. year? 1926. 1926. And who were your parents? What were their names? And what did they do? Well, my father was in the hospital. I had come out of the hospital, went to New York. He was born in New York. He was born in the, over there, but he, his parents, when the ship came over, they moved in Greenwich Village. He was born where? What? Where was he born? Greenwich, uh, in... Uh, Italy? In Italy. Italy. In Italy. Uh, Abruzzi, they call it. Okay, and what was his first name? Emilio. Emilio. And your mom? My, mo uh, my mother was... Uh, <laughs> she, she died so many uh, Where was she born? She was, she was born actually in Connecticut, yeah. Stony Creek, Connecticut. Okay. Family came and the ship landed in Connecticut. They got a house, and her father became a, a ship uh, catch fish. Oh, a fisherman. Fisherman. Okay. And that's how they made a living. He nice. made a living. You remember her name? Who? My your, mother. Your mom, yeah. Uh, that's all right, it'll come. Oh, yeah. It'll come. Died so many years ago. Forget. So, did you have any have any siblings? Enos. 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 Oh, nice. Okay. And w did you have any siblings, brothers or sisters? No. No. Okay. And apparently, you said your dad served in World War One. My dad died in World War One. No, no, he served in World War One. Served in World War One. He came out. He lost a lung. And uh, it developed into tuberculosis when the war ended. And he came home, though, with that. He... And he lived a good many years with it. And that's why I didn't live with them. You didn't live with them? I lived with them at 88 years old. And I, I took a chance. My mother had to double wash the dishes and really? make sure I had special dishes. You know, I couldn't eat out of their dishes. Right. Where did you live until you were eight? Where? Where who did you live with until you were eight, eight years old? I, first, I lived with a grandmother, mm -hmm. and she died. Then I came and lived with uh, my uh, mother's uh, brother in Corona. And, uh, and then he got married. And they got rid of me then. <laughs> but you then, when you were eight, you went back to live with your folk parents. Eight years old. Okay. Yeah, I lived with uh, I lived with a couple of aunts and uncles. So, what were you doing, Rich, before you joined the service? Before you entered the service, what were you doing? I was in school. High school. High school. So, did you finish high school? I finished it. And then, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted into the army yeah i was 18 years old graduated high school got a diploma and went in the army school a couple of weeks later okay Camp up there, not here. and what year was that that you were drafted you i was drafted 1946 1946 uh, no no 46 44 Let's see, I went to 44, 44. So it was right before, a year before the end of the war? Yeah. Okay. So when, 
once you were drafted, then you came, you had basic training in Camp Upton? I went basic training in Camp Upton because I was so on my own. And I wanted to be a paratrooper. Oh. I was interviewed. And uh, the sergeant that was interviewing me said, you don't want to be a paratrooper, son. I said, yes, I do. <laughs> in, in school, it's all I did was jump off ropes and things. Even the gym teacher was afraid, you know, because I was going higher and higher. Those ceilings were high. And jump on, land on ropes, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, then he saw me do it, and he says, okay. And then I had a few guys follow me into it until they wanted to be paratroopers. And uh, he said, only one out of ten come out alive. Oh my gosh. That's what he tells me. So I said, so? Uh, so you'll be the one. <laughs> it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't, didn't bother me at all. So he's okay. So he signs me up. I took a test there at Camp Upton for the paratroopers, passed it, eyes, heart, and feet. Okay. And uh, I get on the train, a bunch of us. And he said, okay, man, we're heading south. We're heading for Fort Belvoir, Virginia. You're going to be engineers. Oh, I said, what? And I yelled out, I'm a paratrooper. He says, no, engineers got priority over the paratroopers. Oh. So I trained all this time for engineering, engineering, and I looked at mines and things like that, you know, life mines. How long was the training for to be an engineer? Huh? How long was that training to be an engineer? Oh, I was there uh, until actually the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge came on when I graduated. Basic training and then engineering. So the engineering training was pretty lengthy. It was yeah, long. Yeah. Like months? Oh, a couple of months. Yeah. Okay. And uh, next thing you know, they said, okay, men, we're shipping. The whole camp is going into the infantry oh. because of the Battle of the Bulge. So they threw us in. We got on the Queen Mary. Mm -hmm. And the Queen Mary went to England, then from England got another boat to La Havre, France, then got on a cattle cars, 20 of us on a, on a cattle car for three days. Mm -hmm. And we went all the way to, to Belgium. And that was uh, if he is Belgium. Okay. He is. And we got there and then all oh, thousands of us and then they started calling names off and allowed them to speak up. And uh, then my name got called First Infantry Division, Richard Piscotti, and so on and so on and so on. They must have called a couple of hundred names for the First Division. Uh -huh. And they, the First Division lost a lot of, quite a few men in the Battle of the Bulge. Were you... This was after the Battle of the Bulge, or? This was after the Battle of the Bulge. Okay, so you They finally pushed the Germans back, and then they were getting set, we got set up. I went into action in Berg, Germany. Mm -hmm. Berg, Germany is the lowest part of, part of the middle part of Germany. Okay. And then we headed towards the Rhine River, and that was the worst, I lived in Saranac Lake, and that was cold. Mm -hmm. This was cold. Really? And you're outside morning, noon, and night. How did you travel to there? On, on trucks, or how did they take you there? You walked? We actually uh, walked. You walked. How long yeah. did that take? Boy, it took us, uh, I got, <laughs> we took the battle, we took Rhine River. Germans flooded to the other side mm -hmm. on my birthday. I didn't think I was going to make 19. Oh, wow. When uh, when was your birthday? What? My, March 10th. March 10th. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to make 19. This is 1944? 1944. I was 45, 1945. 1945. I was 19. 
so you had you were in the infantry now. You weren't doing engineer work. No, no engineering. So do you did, were there a lot of casualties around you, or you had to? Yeah, quite a few casualties. Uh, my uh, I went on a patrol with my sergeant, me and another guy, two old guy in front of me. And we went on the woods there, and all of a sudden he steps on our bouncing Betty. What is that? That's an SS mine. Oh, it's a wow. German mine, they bury it, and you step on three little prongs like that. And as soon as you step on it, it goes up four feet. Seven seconds, it blows up. Oh my gosh! So he steps on, he yells down, and I, I'm ready to go down. I see the guy in front of me standing yet. I jump on him, and as I jump on him, it went off and hit me in a, oh. a leg, Ooh. and a side here, and that put me in the hospital for a while. So this was early, early on when you. Yeah. You stayed in the hospital in Germany or where? In, in Belgium or in Belgium. Belgium. Actually, in Belgium. Yeah. Yeah. How long were you in the service? In this hospital. I was in uh, about a month. Wow. And then you came back out to do more I came service. Back, came out. Went back into action again. Mm -hmm. Now, did other. Were there a lot of injuries or deaths oh, in that? Oh, yeah, my outfit, they were always re being replaced. Mm -hmm. The worst thing I always thought of, I was, like I say, I was 19 years old when I was, uh, I, we took the Rhine River and uh, tr trucks used to come back from the front, from the rear and pull, take all the dead guys that, mm -hmm. and they froze it. They were frozen. Oh, wow. And they would pick them up to, to, to and they throw them back on the truck and throw them on the truck to bring them back. Wow, um, it's terrible. I Just, thought, especially when you're 18, 19, sure. you know. And you knew some of them, right? You knew some, for yeah, sure. Yeah, so after you got out of the hospital, that's why you got the Purple Heart? I got the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. Wow. I was going to the hospital. So after you got out of the hospital, where did you go? Where did they send you then? Back to my outfit. Oh, yeah. And then we fought. I fought. We were still fighting all right up until uh, Vivier's Belgium. And at Vivier's, uh, not Vivier's Belgium. Uh, <laughs> boy, my mind don't want to work. That's all right. Uh, but you stayed in Belgium. No, no, we were in Germany now. We oh. all the way going towards the Rhine when the, finally the Germans surrendered. Uh huh. While we were in Vivier's Belgium. Okay. Not Vivier's Belgium. In this town, I'm thinking, trying to think of. Uh, the war ended, and uh, we Germans had come around, were, were coming around, that lived in the area. Mm -hmm. They were coming around telling us, uh, Roosevelt is taught, Roosevelt is taught, meaning Roosevelt is dead. Oh, he right, died, right. You know. mm -hmm. And when Hitler died, every, we all yelled out, Hitler is taught, Hitler is taught, you know. And that was the end. But they they finally settled down, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were fighting in Brussels, in Belgium and Germany, where were you in like the forest, or did you have a camp, or how did you? We would we just settled in certain areas. Then it was starting to get the weather was starting to turn nice. You know, it was getting spring. You mean you slept outside? You ate outside? I ate everything. Everything. Everything outside. Wow. And we used to get K rations. Okay. That's uh, our little tin cans. Mm -hmm. You open them up with a little opener and uh, you wait it. And it was either beef or pork or eggs or. How was it? It was good. Oh, good. The food was good. Yeah. But how, how did you stay warm in the, when it got so cold? 
that was the hard part. A lot of guys were getting frostbitten feet. Mm. I was lucky I didn't. Really? And we couldn't make fires or anything, you know. So you never got warmed up? So you never got warmed up. Because the Germans were there, we're here, you know, they see the fire mm -hmm. and they start come shooting uh, grenades and mm -hmm. whatever. So what was your, um, did you have a specific position or job that was part of what you had to do? Well, we were infantrymen. We were actually frontline infantrymen. Frontline, wow. Yeah. Uh, how, was it every day there was combat going on? Every day, every day. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, how, did, how did you feel witnessing that destruction and the casualties? How, how did you go on? Well, to me, you know, I was... I thought I was still a kid, yeah. and I see guys getting killed all around me. Mm. Hard. Yeah. It's hard to believe. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, after so you were in Germany when the war ended. I was in Germany when the war ended. I came out of uh, the hospital, went back to uh, my outfit. Uh, I became, uh, what do you call it, uh, watching the Germans marching back, going back to their houses. Oh, like a guard? They had to walk, they had to walk, even if they were BWs, mm -hmm. wherever they were, they had to walk to France, oh. back into Germany. So you monitored that? You had to watch that? We had to watch them just walking by. Mm -hmm. And the funny good thing, the best part of it was I spoke German. How come? I took German in high school. Oh, that must have been good there. I took four years of German, and I really could speak good German. Wow. And they used me as an interpreter. Is that right? So who did you, so you had to talk, interpret what the prisoners were saying? Or? Yeah, what oh. the prisoners were saying, mm -hmm. yeah. I would question them in German, you know. Now how far, I mean, where did you take them? How far did you have to bring them? No, we didn't bring them any place. They just walked them. They knew Germany, so they walked the roads all by themselves. How they ate, I don't know. Oh, I see. Food was very scarce. Mm -hmm. They hardly had any, any food. So what did you do, in addition to that, after the war ended, how long were you still in Germany then? Then I started, my, my legs started to bother me. From the injury? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I said to my sergeant, I said, Sarge, you know, can I get off this thing here? Hit, watch, you know, they had been more, more around as uh, guards, you know what I mean, watching. And uh, he says, uh, oh, go to sick bay. So I went there to sick bay and they, Right away, they put me back in the hospital, and uh, they shipped me to France, north to Belgium. Then in Belgium, I never saw my outfit again. Mm. Uh, and then I went to France, I flew to France. Well, what did they do? Did they help you in the hospital? How long were you in the hospital? I stayed again? in the hospital about two weeks and then a plane came and took about six of us uh, that were wounded mm -hmm. and shipped us to uh, uh, La Havre, France. Uh -huh. Not La Havre, France. Uh, I can't think of it. Well, you, they took you to France. It was up France. It was a hospital outside the hospital. Uh -huh. And the uh, next thing you know, they said, we're waiting for a hospital ship to take you back home. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I never saw my outfit again. Uh -huh. I got on a boat, came all the way to Boston, landed in Boston, and went to a hospital around near Boston, uh -huh. and uh, stayed there for about two more months. Really? Wow. Did you have to have, I mean, were they able to help you with your injury? 
Well, it was more or less just laying there, laying there, laying there, you know. Till it healed? Yeah, standing off it mm -hmm. helped. Mm -hmm. Just laying in bed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after a while, it didn't bother me. It seemed to bother me anymore. I was getting up, going to the bathroom. And, oh, good. Uh, it was hot, you know, sort of. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't hurt. Oh, it didn't hurt anymore. So they said, uh, we're going to give you a furrow, which I never got. So they gave me a 30-day furrow. Mm -hmm. I go home on a 30-day and then 45 wounded furrow together. Ah. So I got 75 days. Okay. And I went home, surprised my aunt. Really? I, you know, wow. I wrote them, I was wounded. Mm -hmm. And then they didn't hear from me again, and I figured, well, I'll surprise them. So when you were, once you were wounded in Europe, you, how did you keep in, you didn't keep in touch with your family and friends once you were wounded? I did. No. So they didn't know. They didn't know. So once you came home and surprised them, they must have been thrilled. I surprised them all. <coughs> a couple of my friends were four reps. Uh -huh. they, they didn't make the service. They were sick, sick kids mm -hmm. and uh, we were the same age. In fact, when I still live, I live nearby. Oh, nice. Walk away. So you kept in touch? We kept in touch and we both moved to Comac. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he was, uh, but he was born with infantile paralysis, uh -huh. so he, he didn't go into service. It's so my age. Uh -huh. So when you came back then and you were better, um, what did you do, uh, at, how much longer did you have to serve? And then I seemed, I was back in, the, after 75 days I went from camp to camp to camp, and then when the colonel called me in, when, I was in Missouri, and he called me in his office, and he said, uh, Richard, he said, uh, we're going to send you to uh, Governor's Island. So he said, I looked at him, he said, you know where Governor's Island is? I said, no, I don't. <laughs> so he says, it's right near the Statue of Liberty. Oh. <laughs> I said, I didn't know that. <laughs> I knew the Statue of Liberty, I knew Ellis Island, you know, those two islands. So he said, uh, you're gonna, you know, we'll ship you there, this way you can go home on weekends. Oh, nice. Whatever. How much longer did you have to serve? I had about another six months. Uh -huh. And uh, so I got the sent there. And I became General Van Fleet, in charge of the First Army Headquarters. Oh. That was, I uh, was in charge. I used to have to pick up his mail, bring it to New York on a ferry. We had our own ferry. Mm -hmm. Bring it to New York, get on a train, and go to 39 Whitehall Street. And who was this for? 39 Whitehall Street. No, but who was the, who, who was this for? You said a general? General Van Fleet, yeah. Van Fleet. Yeah, I used to pick up mail there from him for him, mm -hmm. bring it to him in his, his mailbox, uh -huh. and then take his mail and, and bring it out. Mm -hmm. So with that, they made me a corporal. Nice. And that was it. That was uh, that was it. That was my my corporal. These two stripes. Two stripes, yeah. Nice. Now, before you went to Governor's Island, you were hopping around from different bases. What did you do at those posts before you went to Governor's Island? I was guarding, 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 guarding. Oh. oh. And I went from about three different camps, shoot me from one to the other to the other. Mm -hmm. And finally, the colonel, like I say, said to me, how would you like to go to Governor's Island, you know? Were you happy about that? Oh, yeah. And could go home and be when I When I knew it was uh, New York City. Right. And that I could go home, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a great thing. You know, I, I neglected to ask you, when you first, when you first joined the military, the Army, how was the military life for you, adapting to the the military life and the food and the barracks and all of that, how was that 
for you? At Governor's Island? No, no. When you first got to basic training, in the very beginning, yeah. how was it adapting to military life? Well, it was a little rough, you know, because you had a... I, <laughs> the funny part of it was, here I am, 18 years old, and every, every morning at Governor's Island, we had to stand in front of our beds, make sure your bed is made. And I used to, I still do it here. Good. <laughs> I make my bed. You make your morning. bed. That's great. And uh, I would. Uh, but when you first joined the service, though, was that a big adjustment? The the military life and the food and the all of that. How was that in the very beginning of your service? It was, uh, well, like I say, in the beginning it was rough because, first of all, I was 18 years old and I had never shaved. Oh. <laughs> you know, I used to go like this here. I didn't think I needed it. And uh, I tried it one time and I think I cut myself or something. Yeah. So, uh, the captain would come in every day, every day, and everybody had to stand at attention in front of their beds. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me, he says, you didn't shave. Mm -hmm. So I said, I never shave, sir. Uh -huh. He says, well, I want you to shave from now on. Uh -huh. So I had to go out and buy a razor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. You know, it was something you, altogether, something new right. coming out. Do you remember your um, your instructors for basic training? How What were they like? Oh, they, you mean my the officers? Yeah, the instructors for your training. What were they like? Basic training instructors? No, we didn't have it in, in Camp Upton. There was no train. There was no training there. That was just a place where they wanted to find out where they were going to send you. Right. No, but then once you got sent and you started your basic training, what were your instructors like? Once you started oh. the training. Oh, they were all right. Yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't bother us. Okay. Yeah. You know, we did nothing, actually. The only thing we did was uh, KP. KP was, uh, it did something wrong, like me. Oh, what did you do me wrong? I didn't shave. Oh, they sent you to KP for they that? They sent me for, to KP for that. For how long? Oh, a couple of days. Really? And then I made sure that uh, I went to the nearest camp up, uh, camp. Yeah, camp. It was like uh, they had stores. Yeah, like a PX. PXs and things, so you could buy things. Mm -hmm. So I was able to buy a razor and blades. Good. And so you shaved every day? Then I shaved. <laughs> wow. Well, Almost. Yeah, when you were a kid. Right. It's fuzz. Yeah. It's all fuzz, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so once you came back at the end of the war, um, how did you re how was readjusting to civilian life for you? Well, that was a tough one now. I went back to my with my aunt and uncle. Uh, my father was still alive, mm -hmm. but he was getting bad and he ended up uh, he was, I had him live with me for a while, and then the doctor was, I used to bring the doctor to the house, mm -hmm. and he would, uh, he told me after a while, he said, listen, he says, there's not much I can do anymore. He says, your father is pretty bad. He says, you're gonna have to put him in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we put him in, uh, could you just, just speak up a little bit? He, he's, he said he'd bring him to a hospital. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, my father was in the hospital a while, and then they sent him to a nursing home, mm -hmm. military nursing home, and that was near Fort uh, Titan. Not, not Fort, no, not Fort Titan. When you, when you cross the Hudson River for, uh, the bridge there, because I still got the his window, and I could see the bridge. So were you? So you were able to visit him? So I was able to visit him, and then this happened, and then I had a, just started working. I was uh, 
How old was I then? 20 years old. Working at what? I didn't know. I went from one town place to another in New York City to here at Metropolitan Life Insurance. I went to different companies that were teaching, you know, or uh, taking GIs. A couple of them, I, I quit. Mm -hmm. I quit. I quit. So it was like an office job? Huh? It was like an insurance job or office job or? Well, like a office job, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, so I ended up uh, going to Sperry Gyroscope. They were right near Coma, Coma New White Park. On Long Island? In Long Island, where I lived. Uh -huh. Then I wasn't married or anything. So I went there and I just saw the being built when the war had started. Mm -hmm. They built it, one, two, three. So I said, that's so close by, maybe I should go there. So I went there and I said, uh, is there any jobs? I said, I've been out now. It was 1950, mm -hmm. and I've been out since 46. Well, what did you, did you work? What, what did you do in between, 46 to 50? Any uh, odd jobs anywhere you could get, or? In the city? Yeah, where, what did you do from 46 to 50? What kind of jobs did you do? Metropolitan Life Insurance. I worked for uh, radio repair. Uh. I, I did go to school for radio repair. Mm -hmm. They were taking GIs free, you know, oh. any question on the only problem is I didn't have a car. Oh. You know what I mean? I was twenty years old now. I had no car. And uh, like uh, like I say, and a, a metropolitan was paying me a dollar a, a, a week. Oh my gosh. A dollar a week. A dollar a week? When I quit, they, they said, we're going to give you another dollar. Yeah. I was there six months, and I said, I quit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and then in 1950, you started looking, and you started then, at Sperry? Then I went to Sperry's. I walked from my house to Sperry, and I said, listen, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the service now for four years. I'm still looking for work. I said, is there any jobs you got in here? So they said, how would you like to be an electrician? No. I said, they said, we'll tra train you as an uh, apprentice. Mm -hmm. And after four years taking tests and everything, if you make the, the, the uh, electrician's test, pass it, you're an electrician. Mm -hmm. So they taught me, taught me, taught me how to bend, bend pipe and everything like that, wiring and the whole bit. I loved it. Did you? I loved it. Good. And I was making something like uh, $13 a week. <laughs> Boy, it was a, a fortune. A fortune, yeah. And uh, I saved enough money because my aunt wasn't taking any rent from me. Mm -hmm. She still supported me, you know. And uh, I, I made my uh, I made I made the electricians. Uh huh. Great. And uh, I stayed there for thirty eight years. Did you? Wow. Thirty eight so years. In the meantime, you met your and wife and. Sperry's is getting the money now. Oh. <laughs> I mean, not Sperry's. Uh, this place. Yeah. But in the in the meantime, while you were working at Sperry, you met your wife and. Oh, in, in the meantime, yeah, I went at uh, Jones Beach, mm -hmm. went there with a friend of mine, you know, go swimming, and uh, while we were there, they set, they were parked in a big blanket next to us, and we were on a little towel, mm -hmm. and my wife comes up and she says, would you like to sit on our blanket? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, okay. So I went on there, mm -hmm. and uh, she's six years younger than me. Uh huh. So. And that's how you met. We waited about three years later and okay. got married. Okay. And she comes from a big family, thirteen brothers and sisters. Wow. Her father's Irish, born in Ireland. Uh huh. And her mother is uh, French Canadian. Mm -hmm. 
and then they came to this country. And you had children? And they had 13. No. How many did you have? One, uh, three, four. Four, three boys and a girl. Three boys and a girl. Did any of them uh, join the service? No. Did any of your children join the military? No. No. Um, are you a member of any veterans organizations? Or were you? I used to belong to the American Legion. Uh huh. I had Mr. Egan. I still remember his name. But uh, when, after my father, my father was American Legion too. So uh huh. That was big back, way back. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, when we, just before my father died, this last check he got he used to come to me, and mm -hmm. then he would sign because he, he was in, in a nurse, the nursing home. Right. And uh, he would sign the check, and then I cash it for it tomorrow, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got the last check, he passed away. And I uh, called Mr. Egan up. I said, I got a check for my father, but he died. I said, what do you want me to do with it? He says, write void across it and mail it to me. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and that was the end. I never heard again. Wow. So, Rich, how do you think, how did your wartime experiences affect your life? Did wartime experiences affect my life? I well, never, never did. No. And I got once I, like I said, once I met my wife, and then we got married. And it was over with. You know what I mean? What are some life lessons you learned from the military? What lessons did I learn? Mm. It's a good, a good organization, I'll tell you that. You know, you have to do what they tell you, the sergeant. You know, anybody that's over you, you what they tell you to do, you do. No, oh, discipline. Discipline, yeah. Mm -hmm. I never got, uh, you know, do this, do this, do this, you know. And if I didn't do it, which I did, get the... Uh, they would tell you, you, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have done mm -hmm. this. That didn't happen to you? It didn't happen to me. How do you think your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Having, going, into, going into the war? No, how do you think your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Well, I guess I didn't like it. You know, there's certain things you, especially when you start off, you're nothing, you know, and you're a little afraid of this, a little afraid of that. Uh, and you make sure you, whatever the captain says or the sergeant says, you do. Right. You know. Other than that, uh, do you think you would have joined the military anyway, even if you hadn't been drafted because your dad had been in it? No. No? No. I was a little, I could have joined the Navy, but uh, I have a bad experience of being sick on the ship. Oh. I crossed it on the Queen Mary to England. Mm -hmm. I was sick for, it took us four, four and a half days, mm -hmm. and we went all by ourselves. 14,000 men. Wow. If a, if a submarine would have shot us, sunk us, that would have been a lot of men down. Mm -hmm. You know? So, the, you mean the, you got sea, kind of seasick on the ship? So, seasick, thank you. I was about four days. Just about a couple, of, a couple of days, maybe a day and a half before we got to England. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sergeant says, uh, go, to sick, go to the sick bay. So I went to sick bay, knock on the door, go, come on in. Mm -hmm. So the doctor looks at me, he says, well, what's the matter with you? Mm -hmm. 
I said, I'm seasick. I was green. Oh, wow. He says, what are you trying to do, get sent back home? Yep. So that was it. Uh, oh, back to <laughs> Really? And that was Gee. it. Wow. I did, uh, I laid up my bunk mm. and uh, made sure I never, that's why I, I was glad I never was on a ship. Sure. Wow. I guess it's good you weren't in the Navy. Huh? I guess it's good you didn't go into the Navy. Yeah. Yeah. And I got my son, one of my sons, he had lives in Center Reach, mm -hmm. and the twin boy. He's got a ship from here to Nutskosh. Really? It's so big, it's out here in Patchogue. Uh -huh. Come on, Dad, I'll take you out. I says, <laughs> keep the ship. <laughs> <laughs> you won't go? No. No. <laughs> my wife goes. Mm -hmm. go. Is there anything, Rich, we haven't... Uh discussed that we missed anything about your service abroad or before or after that we didn't talk about? No, not much. I, I, I was good. I was glad I was in the serve in the army. You were? Yeah, I was. I know it was uh, pretty yeah. dangerous. It was dangerous. Yeah. Were you afraid? When you were in the middle of the forests oh, yeah. and in Germany and Belgium? Yeah, we were told to stay near the old timers. Oh, kids yet, you know? Mm -hmm. 18, going into 19. You mean because they knew more of what to do? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a... Uh, what message would you like to leave for future generations that might watch this video? No, just any message you'd like to leave for any any future young people that might watch this video. Well, you have to do what they tell you to do. That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. If they tell you to do this, you do it. If you don't do it, you, you got a problem. They got a problem with you. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of guys that were didn't do what they were supposed to do. Really? They, so you adjusted pretty well to military I life. I adjusted pretty well, yeah. yeah. I didn't want to stay in. Once Once I was in Governor's Island, I stayed there for my uh, two, two full years. Oh, so you, you re... Was that part of your initial commitment? When you get drafted, yeah. When the war ended, you have to... Uh, Make sure that you have at least two years in before you can get out. They wanted me to stay in. Okay. This is uh, the uh, captain actually, mm -hmm. and uh, my captain in Governor's Island mm -hmm. said to me, "Come on, stay in, uh, Richard." He said, uh, "We'll make you sergeant." Yeah. And I said, "No." Really? You said no? I said no right away. Why? I said I had enough. You had enough. Hmm. It was, you know, it was uh, going home. I just assumed be home. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Anything I, else we we haven't covered? Yeah. Huh? Anything else we haven't covered? Uh, you know, I think we got it all. That's about it. That's about it. Well, Richard, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for, oh, for remembering for you're, us. And you're welcome. Thank you for your service again. You're welcome. And I'll read this here. I'll have to get my wife to read it. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> hold on.